today. We're talking about sex, lust, and all the things that make your face blush, especially when you're talking about it in front of 20,000 people, one of which happens to be your mama. Um, so, hey, mom, I hope today is not as awkward for you as it is for me. Uh, but today, today's one of those topics that I can't fully begin to express just how much it matters to me. It matters so much because of my own personal journey, uh, my personal pain, scars, hard learned lessons over the years. Uh, but it also matters a ton because of the freedom and the healing that I've personally experienced and how badly I want you to experience that. It matters also because of the pain, the pain that I've seen in people's eyes, your eyes over the years. It matters because of the tears that I've seen flow over the years. Uh, this last Tuesday was actually my 19th anniversary around LCBC. And besides some really hard funerals, these conversations, these moments are the ones that have hurt the most. Uh, I've literally lost count. I've lost count of how many people I've sat with and sobbed with, sobbed that mom found their search history. The girlfriend saw the Instagram feed. The teacher caught them passing the phone. The wife found the text. You discovered the photos of them together in your home. I can't count how many men has begged me, begged me to help them break addictions that they know are so hurting their wives and their lives. Uh, the number of women just truly broken, crying over trust being destroyed and shattered. How many men I have seen make horrible, horrible choices that have ruined families and broken homes, leaving scars that will last a lifetime. But I've also sat with so many men who it wasn't their lust, their wandering eyes, their distracted heart that blew up the families, but hers. Men who are now left holding the home together to get the kids through school, to get the kids in the counseling because mom blew things up. Guys, few topics break my heart as much as the topic of lust and its awful destruction uh, and the awful destructive road it takes us down. Uh, lust, that urge that, to look, that, that urge to find, to sneak, to hide, and then to the fallout of guilt and shame and all the anxiety around what if they find out, what if it's discovered. I think this topic matters so much to me because if I'm really honest, this was like the first sin that like really ate my lunch as a kid. I mean, it's taken me years of really hard work to find, my, find freedom from this, um, but it has left lingering scars, uh, scars on my life, on my marriage to this very day. And yet it's also one of the most accessible, destructive drugs that are being peddled to us today. It seems like it is now more than ever, easier than ever to start down this road, fully unaware of the nuclear fallout that it leads us towards. Uh, there's some really terrifying research around the effects of pornography and the developing brain and how it literally rewires our brain and lowers its function. Uh, one researcher, this is blew me away, one researcher said 87% of college age men, 87% of college age men and 31% of college age women are looking at porn. Uh, another one, this threw me, blew me away. They said the top three pornography sites are more highly ranked than the most well-known household name sites, Amazon, Netflix, Yahoo, as well as those that are uh, most up and coming, TikTok, OpenAI, ChatGPT, Zoom. Exactly how great is the disparity? In one word, huge. Blank. I'm not going to tell you what the number one pornography site is. Uh, you can figure that out on your own. But the, the top rank, actually don't figure that out on your own. That's a terrible joke. <laughs> the top rank pornography site had 700 million more total views than Amazon, 900 million more views than TikTok, and get this, 1.5 billion more than Netflix. Yearly, 69% of men and 40% of women will view pornography. And there's a lot of ways that we could break down those numbers, but those are just taking a stab at self-reported pornography. I uh, mean, if we started to throw in all the soft porn options, like lingerie sites, swimsuits, beach volleyball, and then if we started talking about what we're consuming on TV, like Netflix, HBO, Hulu, and then ladies, we're not just talking about guys today. I mean, you just saw the stat, 40% of you are reporting of watching pornography. But let's be honest, I don't hear a lot of ladies talking about pornography. What I hear ladies talking about is the book, the TV show, the movie that just stirred something emotionally, that, that created longing and desires. Man, we just need to have 
a super honest conversation today. There's this commonly held belief that this is just natural, that everybody does it. It's normal. It's even healthy. It's harmless. Man, we're going to look at what God says, uh, why this matters in just a moment. Uh, but before we even talk about why God says this, I want to take a start by looking at what secular biology is telling us. So just in case you don't care what God says, maybe what secular biology says will make you tune in a little bit and realize there's some really important stuff that we need to learn around this. But like, did you know, did you know that when you experience an orgasm or climax sexually, whether you're with a partner or by yourself, incredibly powerful things are happening hormonally. Uh, for men, after the, your release, there's these hormones that burn two things into your brain. The hormones burn the place and the face. The place, what is this situation that delivered such an amazing experience? The face, who is this person that delivered such an amazing experience? Which, if you believe in intellectual design, uh, that's one of the coolest gifts God could have given us. I mean, think about that. God wired us, designed us, that when I see my wife, my brain is wired because of sex to go, good things happen with her. What do you need to apologize for to make it right? Or when I walk into my bedroom, my brain is wired to go, this is a magical place. Say you're sorry now, Matt. Like God wired us with this incredible, amazing gift. But that gift is also what makes lust and pornography so destructive, so addictive. I mean, each time you climax to an image that's not your wife, you're branding into your head competing places and faces. But this stuff is so addictive because now all you need to see is a VS or a bunny or an empty house or a home alone, or, and your brain is conditioned to prompt you to say, hey, something really exciting happened here last time. Don't you think we need to figure that out again? Ladies, for you, uh, after you go, your body releases a very different hormone. It releases a, the same hormone that is released when a mom cuddles her newborn baby. It's the bonding hormone. Some of you are having these moments by yourself, and then you're bonding to a book, a TV show. And then you find yourself asking, why do I feel so distant, so discontent? Why are my relationships so difficult? Why does no one seem to measure up? Why do I feel so alone? Which side note, hey, husbands, uh, when you have sex, stay not only until she's done, but until she's done holding you. Let her hormones bond to you. That's got nothing to do with what we're talking about today. It's just free before your marriage. Enjoy. <laughs> we also could talk about uh, the PIDE epidemic, the porn-induced erectile uh, deficiency uh, epidemic. Basically, porn is making men's biology stop working, but I'll leave you to research that on your own. The point is, this stuff, is hurting so many people, so many individuals, so many families, so many couples. And the more we engage in pornography and lust, the more we're messing up our brain's wiring and our body's ability to connect in significant ways. And if this is the bluntest you've ever heard a church talk about this topic, and if you're shocked at some of the words that have been spoken, first of all, I do not mean to be offensive or crude to anyone. We just need to have an honest conversation, an honest conversation as adults. But if we're not having honest conversations at church, where's that gonna happen? Hey guys, I just want you to know, we love people too much to watch them blow up their lives because we're not willing to be honest with each other. As we've read through the book of Proverbs, as we've been seeking wisdom on how do we do life well, uh, what does God say is best, uh, we can't help but realize it has a lot, a lot to say about sex, adultery, being lured away into destruction. It's like Solomon, the author of Proverbs, knew 3,000 years ago that this was an issue, that it isn't a technologies problem or an accessibilities problem, but a human heart problem. It makes me laugh whenever people are like, it's the worst it's ever been. Yes, it is easier now to find stuff than ever before. But lust is lust. And lust has been around since our hearts started beating. So we gotta look at some ancient wisdom today and we gotta ask, what does wisdom look like when it comes to sexual desires? What does wisdom look like when it comes to sexual desires? What is it that our future self is begging us to get right today when it comes to this topic? Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, they are just gold. There's so much amazing content in them. 
I really wanted to read those entire chapters today, but there's just so much that you just need to sit in them. You just need to soak up the richness that they have to offer. So I'm just gonna give us some overviews and pull out a couple of really great nuggets and just kind of pull out some things that we gotta notice in those three chapters so that as you're reading them on your own, you kind of have this as a starting point. Uh, But first, before we start talking about it, I wanna give a quick cultural gender contextualization. So as you're reading them, you kind of can understand what's happening within those chapters. See, when we're reading, what we're reading in those three chapters is between a father and a son. A father trying his hardest to pass along wisdom Wisdom on how to live well and how to avoid serious pain and how to not get trapped in the, and how to not get trapped in all that's out there. And so as we read it, we need to not get tripped up on the genders that are being used. I mean, this today could easily be a parent talking to a child, a mother begging her daughter to listen. So when you read it and you see the role of the immoral woman, you can make that the immoral person because it's not just about women. It's about each of us, male and female, giving into our lustful desires and the dangers that lust can bring upon us. But when you read them, one of the first things you'll notice is the emotions. This pleading parent, begging, begging his son, pleading with him to listen, pleading with him to follow, pleading with him to use wisdom and to not fall into some serious traps. This pleading parent who's seen the wages of sin, who's witnessed the the price that his friends have had to pay, who knows it's fun for 30 minutes, but it'll haunt you for the next 30 years. So we're gonna look at three huge cautions this wise parent is making, and then we're gonna apply them to us today. Uh, But we gotta start with where this parent started. They started with reminding us about what's possible, why this even matters. Don't miss where this dad starts. He starts in Proverbs 5 and he says to this son, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in your wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Man, this dad starts by saying, son, God wants you to have great sex. Man, don't miss that. God wants you to have great sex. The goal, the aim is to have such great sex, such a great connection, such great intimacy that you rejoice in each other, delight in each other, are captivated by each other all the days of your life. That when you see their face, when you walk into your room, your body instantly goes, this brings great joy that your heart is fiercely bonded to the others. This parent is pleading with their kids saying, it's possible, don't lose hope, don't cheapen sex, don't weaken intimacy, don't settle for second rate. God designed it to be amazing, amazing all your life. But let's be honest, even in the healthiest of relationships right now, not many are delighting. Not many are finding joy. Not many are rejoicing in the embrace of their spouse. Because too many of us were given a cheap view of sex, a less than view of sex. Few of us have been taught or discovered that when God designed sex, he designed it to be the byproduct, the end product, the end result of such a profound intimacy of being naked and unashamed, of being fully known and fully knowing that this act of a physical climax is simply the outpouring of a deeper emotional, spiritual, intellectual knowing and being known. Many of us have been told that sex is just a physical thing and we've been lied to. It is such a spiritual thing, emotional thing. It is so much more than just a physical reaction. God designed it to weave us together at our deepest levels. Too many of us have been told that sex is the main dish of intimacy. When really, sex is just the slice of pie after the main meal. And because of that, it is so easy to believe that with someone else, somewhere else, that if we just found the right one, then, then we would find the good stuff. I mean, this dad starts by saying, know that great sex is possible, but that comes from great intimacy. Do the work to be known and to know. Do the work to dig deep into forgiveness and communication. Don't settle for the cheap stuff. 
when God designed you to experience the great stuff. This dad then wisely states, man, there's some things that will keep you from experiencing that. And he gives these three huge pieces of wisdom, huge pieces of wisdom that we need in our lives today. The first piece of wisdom that he says, the first piece of wisdom he says is how to be wise. He starts by saying, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. These passages talk about how this immoral temptation is out there that's hunting, looking, calling, throwing out temptation to see who might take the bait. I mean, just catch, just catch the length that the tempter goes to, to lure in the vulnerable. Listen to the amount of work that's being done to seduce and to lure away in chapter seven. Listen to this. The woman approached him seductively dressed and sly of heart. She threw her arms around him and kissed him. And with a brazen look, she said, I've just made my peace offerings and fulfilled my vows. You're the one I'm looking for. I came out to find you and here you are. My bed is spread with beautiful blankets and colored sheets of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses for my husband is not home. He's away on a long trip. Basically, she said, I made my offering. I got meat to eat. Let me prepare you a meal to fill your belly. I've got perfumes and sweet aromas. I've got soft sheets and luxurious bed. And best of yet, we'll never get caught. We can take our time. This wise parent is screaming, don't take the bait. Don't be tricked. Recognize you're being played. You're being lured. You're being hunted. Wisdom says, don't be made a fool. So let's just be frank for a couple of moments. Some of us know that lure all too well. It may not be cinnamon and aloe sheets, whatever that is, but there's someone who when they smile, they smile just right in your direction. They listen to your stories and they make you feel real seen. They make your emotions just so easy to share. Their curves, mm, their curves curve just how you like them. They're not too dramatic or stubborn or clueless. It's like they just get you. They're, they're just more fun. They're less moody. They're more adventurous, more caring, more responsible, more, more, more of whatever your heart is looking for, longing for, lusting for. So let's keep being frank. Do you know that there's folks out there out of their own brokenness who could care less about your integrity, your marriage, your kids. They're simply in it for the thrill of the hunt, the rush of the moment, and they will bait you into one of the most destructive and regretful decisions of your life. Some of us need to recognize we're in the company of someone who is only thinking about their own pleasure and not what it will take from you in the long run. Some of us, some of us need to recognize that we're being seduced by coy glances. I love how Proverbs 6, 25 reads, don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. This verse is so piercing to me. Um, the reason why this verse hurts so much is because when Pearl and I had to process the first affair among our friends, which it makes me so sad to say that among our friends have been multiple affairs over the last 20 years. But the very first one was a friend from college. Uh, he went off to be a pastor. He was an amazing man, super cute family. But a few years later, we discovered that he was fired. His wife had left him. And it was all because he had had an affair with a coworker. When he shared about it, he said that in hindsight, he realized that it all started when he Get this, when he went out of his way to see her smile, to find out about her weekend, to check in on the project, when his office was to the right, he would detour for small talk to the left. So I gotta ask, I care too much about you and your family not to get up in your business for a second. Is there anyone that you're going out of your way to see smile? to hear about their weekend, to check in on that project? Is there anyone getting more of your attention than they deserve? 
Guys, whenever Pearl and I found out about this, it, it rocked us. Uh, the friend who, sh who shared it challenged us to name anyone who might be doing that. And, and now this isn't for all couples. So know if, you, if you're ready for this, but we ended up on the way home that day sharing with each other the names of the people that we could or were or could see ourselves going out of the way just to see smile. I'm not gonna uh, to lie, that was a super awkward car ride and it hurt a little, but in that moment, things instantly and profoundly changed. The intrigue that was there, that lingering thought, that curiosity, it was blown to pieces. The bait blew up. So wisdom number one, don't take the bait. Wisdom number two, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool, don't be a fool, don't be a fool. One of the things that stood out to me so much as I was reading this parent's words was that he actually never attacked the role of the immoral person, the tempter. See, I grew up in a culture, and I'm sure some of you did as well, where it was their fault for making me stumble. It was their outfit, their attention, their responsibility to protect me from my lust and my temptation which is crazy when you think about it. When my heart is longing for it, there's nothing you can do to stop it. It's not about how much is covered or not covered. It's about our heart. And for those of you who were told it's your responsibility to protect others, it's your responsibility to protect them from their thoughts, from their desire, desires, I am so sorry. That is an impossible burden that has been placed on some of you. And I'm sorry for the pain that that has caused so many of you over the years. I just want you to know that's wrong. That's not fair. That's not right. And you need to be released from carrying the weight of others' sin. But real quick, while we're on this subject, let's just be honest for a second. Don't we all like to be noticed? Don't we all like to gain the attention of others? Now, some of us know that we can get some extra attention by what we're wearing or the way that we give attention to others or the way we smile, or that subtle flirty thing that we do that you know makes them notice you. And just to be real clear, I'm talking about both men and women in this moment. We both do this. So if that's you, or better yet, when that's you, because we're all tempted to do it. We're all tempted to do that thing, to become the tempter, because we all love attention. We just gotta know that when we do that, we gotta know what role we're playing. Proverbs says that when we do that, we're playing the role of the immoral person. When we do that, we're playing the role of the villain in the story. Uh, but back to what this dad is giving advice to his son on. The second piece of advice that he says is don't be a fool. See, he never attacks the tempter. He lets them be the villain of the story. He doesn't put responsibility of failure on them. The one he blames, the fool in the story, is not them, but it's the one who crosses the street to be near them. Uh, listen to this, this is how he says it. He says, I saw some naive young men and one in particular who lacked common sense, AKA the fool. He was crossing a street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by her house. The fool is the one who started walking towards the cliff, not just the one who walks off it. The fool is the one who says, I'm going to knowingly put myself near that, around that, exposed to that. Wisdom, wisdom is recognizing and realizing I don't even wanna be near it to begin with, to not even flirt with fire. Wisdom is screaming, run far, 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 far away from lust and luring eyes and longing hearts. Run so far away that you can't even think of a way to find it. I mean, if you talk to any addict or any recovering addict, the amount that it took to get them high the first time eventually isn't enough and they need more. It works with drugs and it works the same way with lust. There's a rush, but eventually we get desensitized and we want more. And then there's a rush and then we get desensitized and we want some more. And then there's a rush, and then we get desensitized and we want some more. And then there's a rush and a rush, and a rush, and a rush. Another way to think about it. It dawned on me that what took me 10 months to work up the nerve to do with my first girlfriend, took me 10 weeks with my second, and 10 days with my third. Once a pathway is cleared, it's easier to walk down it. What we expose ourselves to makes it easier to justify taking another step. Just a little bit farther, 
just a little bit more. Uh, So let's continue to be frank with each other this morning. Where are you crossing the road? Where are you crossing the road? Where are you crossing the road? Where are you making pathways easier? Where have you gotten a rush sexually, lustfully, relationally, only to become desensitized and now feel the need, the justification to go just a little bit further? What once felt a little dirty to read? That doesn't anymore. What once felt exciting to see on your social media feed? That's normal now. What did you once pray your parents would never see you gaming? That doesn't really bother you anymore. Baby step, baby step, baby step. Or as the proverb said it, I'm not having an affair. I'm just crossing the street. And this dad to his son screams, don't be a fool. If you keep justifying one more step and one more step and one more step, you're gonna wake up one morning having stepped too far. So let's be honest. Where are you taking steps you need to stop? Where are you justifying just a little bit more? Where are you taking steps you need to stop? Where are you justifying just a little more? So second moment of truth here. Over the years, I have come to know my vulnerabilities, my dark side, my temptations, my sin, my weaknesses. And now I'm not prescribing any of this to you. I'm just telling you what I've had to do over the years. I'm just telling you how broken I am. Because I love my wife, because I love my integrity, because I love being able to hand my phone to anyone and have nothing to hide, I have had to own that my integrity, my self-control, my ability to stop, for whatever reason, stops at 9 p.m. For whatever reason, from the time I wake up until 9 p.m., I can stay on the right side of the road. But after nine, it's a wild card. And years ago, years ago, I got tired of waking up and realizing I had crossed the road. I had scrolled too far for too long, too deep. And so I decided years ago that my phone freedom wasn't worth my heart. My phone freedom wasn't worth my marriage. My phone freedom wasn't worth the respect of my kids. My phone freedom wasn't worth my integrity. So at 9 p.m., my smartphone now becomes a brick. Uh, Guys, I literally sat down with my wife and I said, I need you to put a screen time code in that I've got no clue what it is. And then at nine o'clock, anywhere that I could remotely fathom being able to cross the road is off. Anywhere that I could remotely consider being able to take a step further is gone. And so basically at 9 p.m. now, what I can do on my phone is I can set my alarm, I can read my Bible, I can check some emails, and I can play Sudoku. That's all I can do, and I love it. I love the freedom of being on my phone at 9.30, 10 o'clock, and the nights I can't sleep at 11 and not having to worry about it. Guys, I love not remembering the last time I crossed the road. Guys, for years, I made excuses, I made excuses. Some of you are clapping, thanks for that. That makes me feel better. Thanks, 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 I'll recognize it. Um, guys, for years, years, I made excuses early on in our marriage for, for why I did that. But it's been years since I've had to make those excuses. And guess what? I have never delighted in the wife of my youth as much as I have now. I just want you to know it's worth it. It's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it to do whatever you need to do to stay on the right side of the road. It's worth it to do whatever you need to do to stop crossing the street. It's worth it to take whatever extreme measures you need to to keep your feet where they belong and to not wander across the street. It's worth it to lose any freedom to stay truly free. The freedom of my phone is not worth the freedom of my heart. And I want that for you. So do whatever you gotta do to stay on the right side of the road. Craig Rochelle, the pastor of Life Church, he said it this way. He said, the wise put safeguards in place when they're strong to protect them when they're weak. The wise put safeguards in place when they're strong to protect them when they're weak. And some of you, 
need to cross back over the street. And some of you need to put some safeguards in place today. Last piece of wisdom. Last piece of wisdom that this pleading parent begs of their child. As they said, how to be wise, don't take the bait, don't be a fool, and don't be naive. Don't be naive. He said it to him this way. He said, for the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. The Lord sees clearly. The Lord sees clearly. The Lord sees clearly. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your intentions. Just be honest. Do you believe that when God says that this is the best way, do you believe him or not? Just be honest. Do you believe that when God says this stuff will hurt you, destroy you, ruin you, do you trust him or not? Just be honest. A legalism loves to draw all these lines to justify just how far we can go, just how much we can see, just how much we can do. God knows your heart. You're not fooling him. You might be fooling your legalistic friends, but God knows what your heart's longing for. Guys, I can't tell you. I can't tell you how hopeful I have been for today's uh, message. So as the lights come down, I just want you to know what I have been hoping that these Proverbs will reveal. My hope is that future marriages, future, uh, future relationships, uh, individuals, singles right now will experience an incredible freedom, that they will be broken from sin. And here's what I've been praying for, that right now, in this moment, the Holy Spirit, because he loves you and me so much, because God wants the absolute best for you, your marriage, your sex, your, your future marriage, your singleness, that right now the Holy Spirit will so profoundly convict each and every one of us that we can't help but be honest. That we can't help but know exactly where we need to cross back over the street. That we know exactly the bait that we need to cut out of our lives take that temptation away. And not only do we know, we take the bold step and confess. And we run back to wisdom, that we do whatever it takes to make it right, right now. So I just wanna ask, where is God saying, hey, let's finally deal with that? Some of us need to confess that we've messed things up, that we went too far, we did something wrong and we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to confess that to God. And then, then we need to confess it to a wise person who will help us figure out next steps and follow up. Some of us need to confess that we have been the fool who crossed the street and we need to put some safeguards in place today. Some of us need to confess that our legalism has justified a lot, but God knows our heart and God knows our heart's not good. Some of us need to confess that we've been looking at that bait for a long time and we've been desiring it more than we care to admit. And it's time to cut bait. God wants you to feel freedom, freedom from shame and regret to experience complete freedom, forgiveness, and healing. Now, guys, I can't promise that there won't be any consequences from what you confess, but I can promise you that this is the only way to move towards true healing. You don't have to stay in the shame. God offers a fresh start. The beauty of wisdom as a compass is no matter how far off track you are, it meets you where you are and it reorients you to freedom to hope, to life. Whenever you're honest, whenever we're honest with our sin, when we confess it, man, it just rolls right off. So here's what I want. I want everyone right now to pull out their phones. So seriously, please, everybody, pull out your phones, pull out your phones, pull out your phones. It'll make sense in a minute. If everybody will do this, you'll make it safe for anybody to do what's next. So as everybody pulls out their phones, if the Holy Spirit has been convicting you, been poking at something, saying it's time to deal with something, if you gotta tell someone, 
You've got to let someone know. You've got to confess and you've got to start taking steps towards healing. Man, we wanna think that we can do this alone. Here's the truth, you can't. We need others. We need others to help us, to hold us accountable. So in this moment, I want you to think about who's your safe person. Who's a safe person that you can confess to, a person that will love you unconditionally, who will pray for you and point you to Jesus. I I want you right now with your phones pulled out, God's been poking at something. I want you to text him. And I just want you to text at church, convicted, ask me in 24 hours if I did what I know I need to do. Thanks. At church, convicted, ask me in 24 hours if I did what I know I need to do. Do it, get help. Don't stay stuck in this stuff. Reach out for freedom. Now I know that for some of us, this feels way too unsafe right now. And actually texting someone right now, actually may be a terrible idea because of the person who's sitting next to you. So here's what I want you to do. I want everyone right now to take a picture of this screen. I want every one of us right now, whether you're having the Holy Spirit convict you of something or not, I want it to make it safe for everyone. So take a photo of this screen because there's someone who will desperately need to send a text this afternoon. And they need this photo to remind them. They can't send it right now, but they will in a second. So pull out your phone, take a photo, make it safe for everyone around you to do the same. Now, if God didn't convict you, man, that's awesome. Please be praying. Because folks, the percentages say a lot of us need to deal with this. And I know that some of you, you're sitting there going, you wanna deal with it, but you don't have a safe person. So if you text CARE to 20022, CARE to 20022, our staff will make themselves available to follow up with you in the next 48 hours just to say, how you doing? Guys, Manny's gonna play for a little bit on the keys. And I just wanna give you a moment to talk to God, hear what he might be poking at, and then maybe send a text or declare, this is what I will do next. Take a moment, talk to God. Thank you. Thank you that you love us so much that you chase after us and chase after us and chase after us and you extend your hand saying, I'm right here, right behind you to help you, to love you, to lead you, to guide you. And you just beg us to confess and turn and to look into your loving face. God, I know that so many of us, we're afraid that when we turn, we're just gonna see your anger. We're gonna see your disappointment. We're gonna see your shame. But you've told us so many times, there's no condemnation, that there is abundant grace, that there is an overflowing, unconditional love. And so God, I pray that today we will listen to the truth that you are the loving father longing to help us. And we will turn and we'll see you and we'll trust you and we'll follow you and your wisdom towards healing and hope and restoration. God, I pray that right now for those who need amazing courage to start a painful conversation, that you'll give them the courage to start it. Resetting a broken bone hurts, but it's the only way to find healing. So God, I pray that some folks will have a ton of courage to start resetting some broken bones. God, I pray for those who will be receiving these conversations, that you will profoundly be present that you will hold them, you'll give them your strength and your peace and your wisdom. And God, I pray that in the weeks and months and years to come, freedom will be experienced, hope will be had, joy will occur, and hearts and marriages and lives will be simply better because we followed you and your wisdom. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for a church that it is safe to be broken in that grace wins and we can celebrate continuing to become lives changed by you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you and we trust you. It's in your name we pray, amen.